reason I'm introducing, uh, I guess, the question of uh, do animals have language is that what really interests me, and I'm not really researching in this area, but what I think is interesting from an evolution biologist perspective is what is, uh, how did human language evolve? And uh, if there is one aspect, I think, that makes us quintessentially different from any other uh, group of organisms is that we have this capacity for language that differs, I think, quite fundamentally from other animals. And importantly, yes, so... Uh, so, so uh, language being quintessentially different, uh, I think uh, the, the question is, uh, where did it come from? And as an evolutionary biologist, or uh, um, uh, Darwin's idea, the key thing to remember there is that natural selection, which is the engine behind evolution, tinkers with what exists. It doesn't necessarily throw up something radically different. So it's a, um, a tinkerer. Uh, rather than necessarily, as I say, something that creates something really different. So there must be elements of language uh, in our ancestral past for language to possibly emerge. And obviously, all animals communicate, uh, even at the very basic level, uh, as you'll see, they'll need to communicate between members of different sexes. So perhaps the only animals that might not communicate are those that reproduce asexually because they don't need to interact with any other uh, individual of their own species. And animals communicate in a variety of ways. Uh, technically, we refer to the sensory modalities of them, but essentially they can communicate by sight, by sound, or by smell. Let me just give you a couple of little examples of this. Um, a key thing about animal language, or the word language being uh, incorporated into animal communication, I think probably was largely a mistake. Um, uh, was put together or suggested by Carl von Frisch, who was a person that first described the beautiful waggle dance, uh, and he described it as a waggle language of honeybees. And here, this bee that you can see that's waggling her abdomen is providing all of the nestmates with incredibly accurate information about the location and the source, uh, sorry, the location and even the nature of food so that the rest of the hive can go out and find this food. And the waggle is important because it provides directionality against the, uh, where the sun is in terms of where the, the bees should fly out. So it's quite a simple message. This is where you need to go to get food. Uh, it has a, a fairly complex uh, set of uh, instructions. Likewise, this uh, incredible dance by uh, male red-capped uh, mannequins is also uh, uh, in the language of love. And, um, we now know, in fact, how uh, this bird is able to moon dance like this uh, through uh, modern technology of uh, photography. Uh, what's he doing? Well, in a very complicated way, he's sending a very simple message, I am the one, uh, and uh, to the female that you might have just seen rise at the end of, it, end, end of, the, of the clip. So um, animals use visual signals, and uh, uh, I apologize to those of you who are uh, uh, somewhat agoraphobic, but these, um, arachnophobic I should say, but these really spectacular uh, spiders are also doing the same kind of thing. They're using a, a visual cue to send a very specific message. These are all boys, and they're sending a message to a female that simply says, I'm the one that you should be mating with. Um, don't worry if you are ac uh, arachnophobic. These are tiny, tiny little spiders. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, we actually know very little about them because they really were only discovered uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, and uh, they certainly excite people that like this sort of thing. Um, but they probably uh, are uh, being ignored because they're so tiny. But of course, uh, visual cues are not the only ones. And uh, can you imagine uh, arriving new to Australia uh, from uh, Europe uh, and waking up the next morning and hearing uh, this sound, it must have been the most terrifying uh, sound you could possibly think, where something or someone somewhere is clearly laughing at you in the um, It's, I, I mean, I think it's a lovely call, uh, and likewise, um, this is cold, isn't it? <laughs> I've got both calls coming at the same time, but you can hear the sound of the warbling of the... Uh, magpie, um, it's a good pause, it's just inconvenient. Uh, but these lovely calls are forms of communication, uh, but the message actually is a little less um, lovely than you might imagine. 
Uh, these are social animals, and they've got a very clear message to uh, other individuals, which is clear off, this is where I live, uh, you don't belong uh, here. So they're territorial and they're keeping other individuals out. Again, a complex call, but a very simple message. Um, and uh, sometimes the message uh, can get, um, again, even more complex. So these are meat ants, and um, you get areas between two colonies of these ants, and many of you will have seen them, where it looks like the land is moving, the ground is moving, because it's covered in all of these little uh, workers that are engaged in this frantic antenation activity. And again, the behavior itself is quite simple. They're just antenating with each other. But this uh, collective series of quite complex behaviors has a very simple message, which is indicating to the other colony the size of their colony. And I won't go into the detail of it, uh, but the information is largely truthful, although uh, there is, uh, to borrow a phrase, some economy of truth. In other words, there is a little bit of uh, um, wishful thinking on the part of perhaps of the colonies, indicating that their size of their colony is a bit larger than, uh, than their neighbors, uh, and for good reason for doing that. And then uh, I should say that uh, these uh, ants also use the final form of uh, uh, modality, which is odor. And this is perhaps the most uh, ancient and pervasive form of communication in animals. In the case of the ants, uh, they're able to distinguish between individuals from their own colony and individuals from another colony by the smell on the body uh, of, the, of the ant. And this form of communication, I think, is actually really useful to think about it in the context of the evolution of human language because it introduces something that actually has been obliquely mentioned in, in many of the previous talks. Um, for an individual to uh, recognize a particular signal or a particular piece of information through an olfactory modality or through chemical cues, the signaler releases these chemicals and they have to, each molecule of the chemical goes through the, the, um, the atmosphere and it actually has to physically interact with a receptor that's found on the receiver. And what that means then is that, that uh, if that receiver, in the case of this moth uh, sex pheromone, uh, in, uh, uh, is activated, then the moth immediately, the male moth, then immediately recognizes two things. There is a female out there that's receptive to mating, but also uh, the concentration of these chemicals provides it with some directionality about where uh, that female is. But the key point about this is that if the receiver does not have the right apparatus, it's not going to hear the message or it's not going to smell the message. So it doesn't matter how much an individual might be pumping out a signal or trying to communicate, if the receiver does not have the apparatus to recognize that signal, then it's not going to do anything. So there's uh, not a, uh, an infinite number of chemicals that you can use to send these messages, and uh, both elephants and this moth uh, use the same chemical uh, as a sex attractant or a sex pheromone. Uh, fortunately, they're found in different parts of the world, so an elephant, female elephant doesn't walk around with a great cloud of moths uh, hanging around her back end, and likewise, uh, the moths uh, don't get trampled underfoot by uh, 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 utterly confused male uh, elephants. But the key thing here is that, um, and, and the bottom part of this picture I think illustrates that, um, the ants that I mentioned or showed a little video clip of beforehand have a very, very strong odor called an alarm pheromone. So if you pick up one of these ants and just gently rub it between your fingers, you'll smell it uh, very effectively. Uh, that odor, in fact, has been captured by a very creative um, a distiller down on the Mornington Peninsula as a botanical, and they call it angry ant gin. Um, the key thing, though, is that you can't smell all alarm pheromones. So there are other species of ants you might pick up and just gently rub it between your fingers, and you won't be able to detect anything. And the reason for it is that you don't have receptors that allow you to actually detect those chemicals. So summary, then, is that animal con communication, the things that animals do to communicate can often be quite complex, and there's a whole lot of reasons why that's the case but the messages are relatively simple. I'm the one, uh, get out of my territory. Uh, this is our territory size, so you better not invade us. The signals are involuntary, so they're typically in response to some other kind of external force. 
And in mammals, they're often linked with an emotional scent, an emotional state. So when we communicate happiness through laughter, this is probably one of the few truly emotional forms of communication that we have. I would like to think that none of you think that I'm standing here feeling nervous at all because I'm providing this uh, 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 presentation in a cool and relaxed way. In other words, I'm not reflecting uh, my true emotion uh, in terms of, of giving this, this, uh, this presentation. But in most other mammals, it's often linked with an emotional state. So this... LNS uh, catalog, sorry, number 163508. I'd have to listen to that. Um, but this is a food call from a chimpanzee, and I'm sure all of you have heard it. Uh, and these... Yeah, here we go. Uh, and these calls um, indicate a whole lot of things, but one of the things in particular they indicate is, I've just found some food, uh, so come and join me. But it's an involuntary response. And Jane Goodall provides a lovely little uh, vignette of this where she describes a young individual that had found a large cache of bananas that had been thrown out of the research station. And this uh, chimpanzee was trying to suppress its food call by uh, because it didn't want to share the food with any other uh, members of the troop. Now, interestingly, we think of chimpanzees as being a bit smart. Uh, many years ago, I worked on some house sparrows, uh, and they never had that problem. If the food was there and available and easily um, uh, uh, um, utilized by lots of other birds, then they would chirrup like crazy, and other birds would come and join them, and they could forage in safety. And if the food wasn't divisible, they kept quiet and just fed on it on their own. So who is smarter, uh, chimpanzees or house sparrows? This brings us then to human language. And uh, in humans, uh, communication is voluntary. I'm not responding to some emotional state by talking and by communicating right now. I use symbols, uh, not necessarily icons, although uh, uh, the earliest uh, talk about uh, uh, some of the Greek language, uh, ancient Greek language, I think was fascinating in, in the use of symbols within that. Importantly, unlike animal communication, uh, language has generativity, so we can construct complex messages. Importantly, language is recursive, and I'm sure I'm, uh, every, uh, experts in languages here are uh, uh, aware of this. So, for example, uh, the key feature of language is this recursive thing. This is a house that Jack built. Uh, this is the malt uh, that lay on the house that Jack built. So we're building through a recursive process uh, a particular story. This allows humans to communicate ideas and concepts about the past, the present, and the future. If I said to you, and I'm going to say it, this morning I saw a light bulb floating in a puddle, most of you, I think, would now have in your mind an image of a light bulb floating in a puddle. Uh, now, some of you uh, may be imagining uh, those light bulbs with a curly tube in there, and I don't know whether they float or not. So, if you're imagining that, your light bulb might actually not be floating quite as well as a light bulb that has that large, uh, uh, old-fashioned light bulb that's got lots of air in it. It'll, it'll bob along. So some of you are thinking of different kinds of light bulbs, I suspect. And many of you may be thinking of different kinds of puddles. So you might be thinking of a puddle on the side of the road, or you might be thinking in a much grander way of, I don't know, a, a, a puddle as being Lake Geneva or something like that. But the point is, None of you, I think, will have ever seen a light bulb in a puddle, but you can imagine it. And that's the key feature, I think, of language, in that we can actually suggest things that you haven't necessarily experienced before. So, what is this capacity? Uh, well, philosophers refer to it uh, as theory of mind, and, and I'm not even going to begin to try and explain it. I like to think of it a little bit as a kind of empathy. What that means is that you uh, understand or can empathize with the things that I'm saying. Now, remember with those uh, olfactory um, communicating insects, they had to have the receptors that actually got fired by a particular message. Well, our messaging is much more complex than that, but we still nonetheless need to have that empathy or that theory of mind that allows us to uh, understand what someone is saying. Do animals have theory of mind? Well, I think the answer is a little bit, uh, if it is possible to have a little bit of theory of mind. Um, and the best examples of research that's been conducted on, uh, on uh, particularly on corvids, uh, ravens, 
uh, and uh, uh, magpies and, and that group of birds that seem to have terrific capacity to uh, at least anticipate or understand anticipatory behavior on the part of other individuals. So there is possibly some capacity for theory of mind uh, in, uh, in non-human animals, but it's notoriously difficult to demonstrate. Um, so there is a bit of background for theory of mind, I think we'd have to say, in the animal world. The next question is, so how did language itself evolve? Well, the conventional way, which was first really established by Darwin, is that it evolved from the grunts and whistles and sounds of our ancestors. Michael Corballis, uh, formerly at uh, University of Auckland, suggests, I think, a much more compelling argument for uh, the theory of, uh, of the evolution of language, and he argues that it developed from a gestural base. And I think that many of the talks that we've had today would uh, emphasize uh, that, um, uh, that, that there's a lot to be said for that. So this is Darwin's idea. Um, where is it a problem? Well, there's little point trying to get great apes to talk. They can't. Candy, uh, one of the more famous uh, bonobos, um, certainly can understand human speech, but simply can't produce it. However, great apes communicate very well visually and, and by using and inter interpreting gestures. And uh, they also have the capacity for intentional communication as well, which is clearly an important part of our language. So this is probably the closest approximation of non-human language that we have. So in other words, perhaps language has a different origin through a visual rather than a sensory modality. For this to happen, again, we need to be able to have the capacity to empathize with particular visual gestures. And what we were looking for then is some evidence in our phylogenetic background for that capacity to take place. And some wonderful experiments undertaken by an Italian group in the end of the last century uh, was able to show that. And they refer to these things as uh, mirror neurons, but essentially it allows some mapping between uh, what the receiver is seeing and what uh, the signaler is actually doing. So on the... I really can't do it on both, can I? Um, so if you look on the right-hand panel of the graph, uh, right at the top there, you'll see a monkey grabbing a peanut uh, off a plate. And this fires up a whole lot of activity in the brain of the monkey. What's important is if that monkey sees someone else take a peanut off a plate, then you get a similar firing of the neurons. So in other words, the monkey's neurological <coughs> processing is rather similar whether it's picking up a peanut or whether it sees someone else. That provides us with some uh, confirmation that the whole process of gestural activities can be empathized uh, on the part of the receiver, even if they're not doing it. Broadly, uh, gestural language is a rich and uh, effective way of uh, communicating. Uh, and uh, the story I like here is uh, that uh, Galladay University, uh, where they have a very rich and extensive program of uh, degrees, uh, is all done in signing language. So when you go there, you don't hear anything except the birds, perhaps the background sound of the traffic, but you don't hear the vigorous and intellectual debates that are going on because they're all being done uh, by signing language. So there is absolutely a capacity for language to be very effective, and I think as we heard earlier on today, that, si that visual language also extends, of course, to written things as well. Um, and so uh, it seems very likely then that the um, basis of, of our language has um, a gestural, a gestural uh, evolution, uh, and that uh, then, I think, uh, makes it much easier to, uh, to imagine this evolution. So vocal communication in great apes is, is involuntary, um, and they're capable of voluntary communication, however, using uh, gestures. Sign language is a very sophisticated uh, uh, form of language, and articulated speech, uh, which has clearly got many benefits, um, is likely to evolve uh, subsequently, uh, uh, or at least this is my Michael Corvallis, I think, very compelling argument, uh, has subsequently evolved uh, from a gestural language base. And as a postscript uh, to, to this, 
I think that one of the things that um, people often think about when they're trying to imagine that uh, animals have language is that this introduces um, a, a rather, I think, unhealthy sense of, of anthropomorphism. And this is illustrated very nicely by a little video that went vaguely viral uh, last year. Um, what you can see, we well, can't see so easily, but that moving um, petal on the, on the right-hand side is being carried by an ant. And the bumblebee, which uh, is deceased, has been um, encircled by uh, these, um, these little uh, petals. And um, the, um, uh, the byline of this particular uh, uh, video clip was how beautiful that these ants could have the sensitivity to provide this dead bumblebee, bumblebee with a dignified uh, funeral, uh, surrounded by beautiful flowers and by these uh, well-meaning uh, and beautifully spirited ants. Uh, the reality, however, is probably a little bit different. Uh, that certainly makes us feel good to think of ants feeling that way. I think the language of the ants would probably be more akin to uh, road rage uh, rather than, uh, than, the, uh, uh, the, uh, than condolences. And the reason for it is that these ants actually uh, typically take little flower petals into the nest where they're consumed by the larvae. Uh, I suspect what's happened here is either the person who did the video stuck the uh, um, a bumblebee on top of the nest entrance or it just happened to get there by luck. These ants are trying to get their food down to their nests. Their language to the dead bumblebee is undoubtedly, uh, if they have any at all, uh, I think very unlikely to be uh, disrespectful. Uh, to be, yes, it's probably more disrespectful. So animals absolutely communicate. And uh, that uh, transition between uh, animal communication, uh, which is absolutely ubiquitous across animal world, into the language that we have, I think most likely had a gestural basis. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I'm interested in the, the date that you gave of around 50,000 years ago for vocalisation. I've never heard it, so I'm, this is all new to me. How do you think that fits with um, the habitation of Australia then, that we're hearing 60,000, 65,000 years plus uh, for Australia. I mean, of course, there was still connection with through to Papua New Guinea, but I'm just interested in in um, sort of uh, those two dates together. Um, I thought about that actually during the presentation earlier on uh, that was uh, talking about the age of, of uh, our ability to vocalise. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that date may well be wrong actually um, and needs to be revised. But the point is that the evolution of all of the um, anatomical and physiological apparatus that we have uh, for language uh, is relatively modern um, and, um, and and that's really I think what stimulated Michael to uh, uh, Michael Corballas to suggest an alternative route I, I think the key thing about this is that as I say evolution tinkers with what exists and uh, and the mode of human language, although we tend to think of language as being spoken, um, actually has a, if you, if you look at the there's no particular reason why language had to evolve into spoken language. And the fact that, that we can communicate very effectively by, uh, by signing language, and it would appear that people can communicate very effectively and tell stories in particular, and imaginative question at my own forum, it's indulgent. Um, I actually wanted to ask, um, Jehan, now that you know that the computers aren't very good at poetry, you know, at this level of emotion, 
what will you do next? Are you trying other modes of creativity or is it kind of like, okay, it's no good, we'll go in a, a different direction? Uh, no, we, we basically are trying to uh, make them write poems with emotions. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so, so we have a, a, a couple hypotheses how we can do that. I think um, uh, one thing that we observe how, how machines write poems is that they're, they're writing word by word, right? As, as in it's a very flat structure. You, you just write word, word by word, and then you keep going. But, but humans don't write poems like that. You write po Before you write poems, you already have an idea what you want to write about. You, there's something you want to express, maybe about a love, a loss of a loved, per loved one. There, there's an idea. So, so we want to, to sort of take that approach and, and put it into the model. So before it even starts spitting words, we want it to come up with an idea first. What, what do you want to talk about? And once you have that idea, then write the poem. I don't know if that gives you emotion, but that's sort of one, one, one take that we, uh, that we think might be helpful to help, help it build emotions into the poetry writing. Yeah. Hopefully that, that makes sense. <laughs>